Hello and welcome everyone to this new episode of Gapshap with Gil. Usually when I have a guest I am able to you know have sort of a, a introduction for 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 him because I particularly know uh, the area of expertise of my guest but today I have one such guest who for whom it's very difficult to pinpoint and pick one area of expertise. He's been a writer, he's been a filmmaker, he's been, he, he's done commentary, he's done podcasting, he's an analyst, he's done consulting for a lot of T20 teams. He's also a YouTuber now and like to call his videos as video essays and we are all a fan of his work. So I have with my uh, with me Jared Kimber today on this episode of Gapshap with Gil and since it's too difficult for me to sort of give an introduction for him, I'd leave this part on Jared himself. Jared please go ahead and introduce yourself. How would you like to call yourself as or how would you like to introduce yourself as uh, I'm Jared Kimber and I do a lot of things in cricket <laughs> I think I I think that's the, the that's the best and the shortest line that can explain what you do because it, there's seriously nothing that in the field of cricket analysis and I'd say broadcasting that you haven't done you started out as a writer uh then you started doing filmmaking you've also written five books and uh, you've also done commentary a lot of people would not know that and uh, now you make these awesome youtube videos which everyone waits for so you know just just tell us about uh, about how you started and you know uh, where is what is the inspiration behind your style of writing because your style of writing is quite different from uh the writing style that you get with other other good authors and writers of the game you have a lot more uh what what we indians would like to call it as masala in its writing because you you certainly sometimes you know take a few liberties which a lot of other writers wouldn't so what is the secret and what is the thought process behind your writing according to you um i suppose a lot of it is because i'm self taught i think is maybe the most basic uh way of putting it um uh i wouldn't say that i take liberties because that makes it sound like i'm making stuff up but um uh i mean essentially i i think i just come at it from a very different point i grew up reading um very standard newspaper writers in australia uh guys like uh rod nicholson and ken peace and crash craddock and uh, you know they they clearly had a lot of knowledge but they it didn't always come through in their writing because as i've now learnt as i'm older that they were writing for a newspaper audience which didn't actually care that much about who victoria's backup opening batter was um and so i think that to start with that's what i i started doing but the the whole i think that most journalists in sport start as either fans of the sport or journalists and those are two very specific things and i probably start as a writer i was trying to be a screenwriter or a novelist when i accidentally got into cricket the uncle jrod character from cricket with balls was um on my original blog was um it's a heightened version of me but it's not you know it's it was written in a character's voice because i was writing a character for a novel in that same voice at the same time um and so that is why he has a silly name and that's why he said silly things like you know he wanted to carpet bomb Brad Hogg or whatever else I wrote back in those days um and and so i think that those sorts of things uh probably make you a different kind of writer than other people i i come at it from a completely different angle than everyone else to begin with um and and then you know the other thing was that the, the sort of conversations i was having with my friends outside or in a cricket ground when we were watching victoria play or australia play were far more detailed and far more interesting than anything i was reading and it wasn't that i didn't think the cricket writers could write that it's just that they weren't and so cricket balls came out of that um but as far as my writing style goes it, it's it's quite interesting that I think other people fixate on it a lot more than I do. I didn't really realize it was that much different to anyone else until very recently. Remember not that long ago, a couple of years ago I had a um a novella that I wrote about my father that Amazon were going to um publish as part of their short stories thing. And one of the the comments we got back from Amazon was that it was such a unique way of writing. And even now I don't it doesn't read that unique to me but obviously to other people it is but if you look at my career like cricket with balls is absolutely nothing like i used to write for um 
well, early Crick Info or Wisden or the other places that I wrote for. The, the later sort of feature stuff that I wrote for Crick Info isn't really like the early stuff that I wrote for those other places. The data-led stuff is completely different again. So I'm not even sure that I have one kind of writing style that, and that's where I probably come back to me being a writer rather than um, a, a journalist or a, um, or, or a, 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 a cricket first person in that I have probably many different ways that I can write um, and, and have written. I mean, you talk about, uh, you talk about the style and the, was it the Masali said, <laughs> but yeah. you know, there aren't many cricket writers. There aren't many writers in, in, um, in sport that use a heavier, data analysis than I do in, 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 in what I do as well. So, you know, I can go from writing uh, about, you know, mental health and suicide and describing things that happen on the field, you know, in great detail to, you know, explaining spreadsheets um, in the same way. So I probably don't look at it the same way everyone else does. I think what I have found, and you get this a lot in, in your career, when you, especially when you've been around for a long time, people attach different things to you. So there are a lot of people that still think of me as the cricket with balls guy. There's a lot of guys who only think of me as the analytics guy. There'll be now a whole bunch of people that only remember me from Crick Info or from the YouTube stuff or from commentating on TalkSport, whatever. And everyone sort of picks the thing that suits them. And there are very few people that sort of realize that you can write this and write that. I mean, I wrote an article the other day uh, where I wrote about the effect that money has on sport on the field. <coughs> And someone said, oh, there's not a single line here about A.B. De Villiers wearing a cape or Mustafiza being a unicorn and all this sort of stuff. I'm like, no, some of my pieces don't have that. And I think that uh, that may be uh, something that people just don't notice as much. They sort of gravitate towards the sort of content of mine that they like. Um, whereas I probably would say that being a writer first, there's just a lot of different kinds of things that I have done and will do. You know, uh, it's 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 good that you mentioned uh, the article that you wrote on uh, A.B. De Villiers and uh, Mustafizur also that the video that you do. So what I've seen is that whenever you do these videos or you write these articles, you always draw a parallel to other sport. Uh, quite a lot of times you've drawn parallels while writing a cricket article about base uh, with baseball, especially when it comes to bowlers, uh, their wrist and everything. And you've also you know mentioned how you used to watch basketball. In the ABD article, you written, you also compared uh, how the likes of Serena and Federer have also been able to put that money to, you know, elongate their careers. Is there any sport that you don't follow? Oh, there's tons of sports I don't follow. I hate tennis. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, was, um, I was a tennis coach when I was little, and I'm not sure I even ever enjoyed playing it that much, let alone, although I did enjoy coaching, to be fair. Um, uh, so I don't watch tennis. I couldn't tell you the last time I watched a tennis game. Uh, from beginning to end uh, and in fact I probably it, it's I probably haven't watched a baseball game since the last time I was at a baseball game which was I don't know 2014 or something I uh, watched Detroit and Oakland in the playoffs that year um, uh, but yeah no I do follow a lot of sport it's one of those things that people see what you do and they I remember I remember there was this little period where a bunch of people online would call me a cricket savant and I was like guys like, I'm not being rude, but I could do this about basketball tomorrow. <laughs> like, I could do this about Aussie rules if I cared. Um, I probably, basketball's maybe the only other sport that I would write about full-time if I got the opportunity. So just, I'm not sure I like another sport enough to dedicate three or five years of my time to, to learn everything I need to know. Um, but, you know, if you're a good writer, you're, you can kind of use those skills anywhere. And I think that I think that one of the biggest problems we've had in cricket and why cricket hasn't developed as well as it should have um, at times is we don't look outward. We're so convinced that cricket is such, it's such a unique sport. The amount of things that I have learnt from basketball over the last three, four years that can be used in cricket. And they're completely two different sports. But there are things about player development. There are things about efficiency that they are very good at. Um, you know, uh, so many different things that basketball has, um, and and that can, and that, if that's the case for basketball, then that's the case for almost any sport. So I don't care if it's ice hockey or netball or rugby or any of these sorts of things. And what I try and do is, basketball's probably the only sport that I watch a lot of outside of maybe Australian rules football um, that isn't cricket these days. And there's only so many hours in the day, and I have children and a job. Um, but 
but I try and stay on top of different trends in different sports. So, you know, there was that thing a couple of years ago about ice hockey goalkeepers starting to catch the ball more. I wanted to know why that was the case. You know, we now have a, a baseballer, um, a, you know, who's a, who's a great all-rounder. Why have they never had all-round baseball talents before when we've had them in cricket since, you know, the dawn of time? Um, those sorts of things are, are very fascinating to me. And, you know, I, I followed them up. And so, you know, I remember someone writing a really good piece about the age of tennis players and how it was changing, but only for rich players. And so that stuck in my mind. So I, I don't think, I mean, I suppose it all goes back to the, the great, um, you know, the, the great quote about cricket, those who only know cricket. Um, essentially for me, there's a whole wide world out there and there's, you know, a lot of different things to look at and to learn about. And if you're a writer, you probably think more in those sorts of terms. Um, and perhaps if you're a, just a standard uh journalist in your field you probably just think about the thing in your field so uh yeah i watch a ton of basketball <laughs> um and I, but i follow i follow writers i follow uh, sports business writers sports media writers sports science writers um, analytics writers i've got friends who write about analytics um right across the, uh, you know i've got a couple of friends who do some incredible work in baseball um uh, you know i follow some of the guys from driveline baseball who are doing incredible things uh at at the same time, I'll, you know, I, I've got a lot of friends who do some incredible work in basketball. So, you know, I'll be pestering them with questions. Um, I think it, it's, it's just how my brain works, really. So it, it, it's a very good point that you make because I've, I've, you know, found that even cricketers, someone like a Yuvraj Singh has also spoken of how playing golf helped his bat swing a lot and it enabled him to hit, hit sixes more easily. So I think you're very right about the point that uh, all sports can sort of pick something from other sport and learn about it. And we have seen, I think the best example of that uh, in today's times is A.B. De Villiers, who's, who's played so many sports at uh, at the junior level that uh, that he can, you know, uh, make use of it. I, I remember reading somewhere that the reason he could play the scoop so well was because he used to play hockey. And in hockey, you have the scoop shot. So that was one of the reasons why he could do it. So definitely, a, you know, a, a very interesting point, which sort of gives a a lot of food for thought for, for, for a lot of us. Uh, another thing, you know, uh, Jared, that I want to talk about you, like you yourself mentioned that you're a very uh, data heavy writer and you, you do a lot of heavy analytics. And uh, before doing this show, I asked people if, if there's something that they, they want me to ask you. And there was this, the, quite a few people were fascinated by the amount of data and the numbers you bring in and how do you get it? Like even when you are doing historical pieces or writing a, or autobiography, uh, like you, you wrote something on test matches. So, from where and how do you get that data? What is what is it that you look for? Uh, you know, what kind of data do you look for? Firstly, and how do you get it? Is there a way that you scrap it from some site? Someone even asked that is, would you be willing to share a code? I'm pretty sure that you, won't if if you do that. But what what it is behind? You know, uh, how do you get all that data? Uh, well, I, I've got Andrew Sampson's um, uh, system. Uh, and you can contact him on Twitter and buy it off him. I think it, uh, it costs a couple of hundred bucks a year. Uh, obviously, I have access to Crick Info um, uh, and uh, uh, stuff, and occasionally they're, they're data people. I've also got other people. There's also Crick Sheets the, um, uh, uh, to get information. But yeah, I suppose mine comes from a bunch of different places, to be honest. Um, I, I, look, I'm looking for... <laughs> I'm pretty good at being able to look at a game and see someone being different and be able to match that to data. So for instance, you know, I'm doing something on BJ Watling at the moment and I assumed that there would be something peculiar about BJ Watling's batting because we know he's limited. He says he's limited and yet he's going to go on. What's he got the fifth or sixth best wicket keeping batting average of all time, right? So if he's limited and he's making all those runs, there must be some sort of code that he has worked out. And it turns out that he is phenomenal when the ball is on a length outside of stump, which is the best place to be good. Because if you're good there, that's where like the majority of the balls are going to be delivered to you by a seam bowler, right? So you can overcome any other weaknesses you might have by the fact that bowlers are always going to default 
to bowling at the top of off stump or around the top of off stump. Um, and if you're good at that, um, it means that you don't necessarily have to be great at everything else. Now, did I know that that was what he was going to be good at? No. Did I work out that there must have been something within his game that didn't make sense? Yes. So then I go looking for that. And it's the same with the Neil Wagner video, the same thing of, I knew he bowled a lots of short balls and I knew he wasn't particularly fast. So then it's on me at a certain point to work out, well, how many short balls does he bowl? And, uh, and, then, it, and then you're looking at, is he actually doing what other bowlers are doing with little spells or is he doing something else that no one else has done? And you know, you, you're looking for those sorts of anomalies, I suppose, within any player realistically of how they do things and you know we don't have stats on everything you know we, you talked about ab views before my guess is that we might one day be able to tell if ab views is into position or a player like ab views is into position earlier than other players my guess is him and bradman um and a few other players you know throughout history have probably just been in position uh, barry richards is probably another one where they're just probably into position earlier than everyone else which means that they're not really reading the ball they're reading the field they're reading the captain they're reading the bowler and they're already there um we're now at a position where we can start to work all that sort of stuff out crickviz just put up a tweet a couple of minutes ago with the top bowling releases you know and um we now it's not about you know it's well, this, this is something when we talk about the multi-sports thing in basketball, we have always been so fascinated in basketball with players heights. And it's only the last couple of years we realized that players heights are absolutely pointless because that all that tells you is where the top of their head is. The most important thing really is their standing vertical or their wingspan, right? Because what you really want to know is what the top of their finger can touch, right? So if you're, if you're six foot 10, but you've got a massive wingspan, you might be able to go a foot, you know, a couple of inches higher than someone else who's seven foot two with a small wingspan, right? And it's all those sorts of things that I am looking for. And if, and if I see a player who, where something is not right, they're not being picked when they should be getting picked or um, they are getting picked when they shouldn't be getting picked or they're making runs, but they're not making runs in the way that you would make it. I go, I just investigate it. So for me, it's, it's like when I, when I, when I talk to cricket teams about working for them, they're like, oh, you want to do money, money ball analytics. I'm like, no, I want to do due diligence. <laughs> you don't even know why your good players are good. Right. I want to find out why your good players are good. Because if that, if something stops with them being good, how do you know what that thing is? Right. So let's go through it. Then we can develop them and we can say to them, but this is what you, why you're a really good player, right? This is, this is your absolute strengths. Here's three of your weaknesses. Which one of them should we look at fixing? Do you think you can fix this one? And the player will go, I don't even think that's a weakness. Great. If you don't think that's a weakness, that's the easiest one to upskill. You've probably just been a little bit unlucky, right? And we can do it. And it's exactly the same thing, whether I'm working for a player or writing an article, I'm looking for the, those sorts of things. Um, and uh, and that's that's where I go. It's, I suppose a lot of it just comes from curiosity. You know, uh, I was just completely fascinated when you just mentioned that the the thing about B.J. Watling is that he's good uh, on the full length outside the off stump. And you mentioned that that is where majority of the balls are going to come come to you from most seam bowlers in test matches. And it's not just that majority of the dismissals also are from that mm -hmm. delivery, whether it be you know, nicking to the keeper or, uh, you know, nicking to the slips or the ball coming in. So I, I was very fascinated with all that that you mentioned. Now, when you mentioned that, that basketball part, that how much is the wingspan of, uh, of I remember, you know, starting something similar to, uh, uh, you know, when there was a study on Michael Phelps, when he had won all those eight goals in Beijing uh, 2008 Olympics. I think that is once, I'm not sure if you've done that study or not, but I think if you do that study also, you'll find out that, this, that could be one of the particular reasons because what that study said was that usually when someone's tall, there's le their legs or the lower part of the body is, is taller. But with him, it was a different case. It, he, he had some very wide arms and uh, uh, his upper body structure was, was taller than his lower body structure, which, which allowed him to, you know, uh, send more water backwards while trying to swim than what uh, others would. So they, the, 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 I, I look, that, I'll give you a cricket one straight away if you want it. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Most of the fastest bowlers of all time have a double jointed elbow or a hyper extensive elbow, right? So I'm not sure if I'll be able to show it to you here, but my elbow is double jointed, right? 
So it go, my arm goes down and then my arm goes up. I don't have the ability to bowl fast because I don't have fast twitch fibers and all the other problems that I don't have. But Sean Tate had elbow problems. Jofra Archer has elbow problems. Watch Jasper Brummer in super slow motion, right? There are little things that we haven't, we haven't even scratched the surface of these sorts of things yet. For, for instance, we're only just over the last 20 years working out what batters look at. We were always convinced that batters in baseball and in cricket had better reflexes and better eyesight than everyone else. Turns out that they have above average eyesight, but not like massively above average eyesight. And Albert Pujols, the baseball slugger, um, was recently tested and doesn't have particularly good reflexes. He has worse than average reflexes, right? So how is it that he can hit a fastball at 101 miles an hour, right? And that's because he's not reacting to it. He's reacting to the pitcher and what the pitcher has done beforehand and the 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 wrist position of the pitcher and the body position and everything else. And I think that we are not even, even slightly there yet. So when you talk about, you know, Phelps and when I talk about basketball, we're just starting to learn some of this sort of stuff, right? You know, very, very basic things of, um, and, and it's not that athletes and cricketers didn't know some of these things beforehand, but now we're in the, bit, in the middle where people like you and I can actually just like start to investigate them and see what's right. There's a really fascinating one in the NFL where people were convinced for a long time that hand measurement was really important with quarterbacks, except for the fact that when it turned out that no one was measuring hands in the same way twice, <laughs> there was no like <laughs> universal way of doing it. And that some of the greatest quarterbacks of all time actually had really small hands, right? But again, this, this, is, this is a great thing to know that people are now being able to go out and look at it. How many quarterbacks weren't drafted in the, in the NFL because someone shook their hand and went, it's not a big hand, is it? And it was, we can't have that. We can now learn about those sorts of things. And I think that that is those sorts of things really, really help us understand um, what makes different athletes work. But then the flip side of that is you talk about Michael Phelps having having the you know the, the really long torso the flip side of that is what what happens when the next great swimmer comes along and they've got really long legs what can we learn from that person that we haven't learned before you know is there a way of using your legs differently is there a new swimming style that you could use in freestyle that would actually help your legs better right and so I think the the original movement in sports was towards moneyball moneyball is this really I see it as a really negative way of looking at sport because you're basically going, oh, this guy can't do this, this guy can't do this, and this guy can only do this. Whereas the new revolution in sports really is to go, we've got this athlete and he's really, really good at this. Why don't we just get him to do this forever, right? And we've got this other athlete who's really good at this, but he's being held back by this. All we need to do is really get him even on this and he'll be so good at the other thing. And I think that, that's what, where I find all this sort of stuff really really exciting the more we can learn about how athletes work and how to make them better uh it's just a huge advantage well i mean i'm i'm, I'm actually lost for words with, with the information that has just uh, come to me in the last two questions like you mentioned of the uh, hyper extension i i know you know uh, when you did that video on mr fizzle rahman you had mentioned just with umrah as well as while you were comparing their workload so I, I, rem I, I remember that part. Uh, also, uh, you know, the, it also brought my, took my mind back to Shoei Bakhtar. I've, I've, you know, heard him speak and he always keeps talking of, you know, how he had uh, very different elbows and he always had uh, very different knees. He always, he always had issues with it, but somehow he was just able to pull it. So, I mean, you're, you're pretty spot on with it that we are just starting to discover that uh, you know, how much is, is there to, you know, how much can biomechanics can affect a particular performance or a particular part of uh, of a sport? Uh, enthralling, really. Uh, the next thing that I, that I want to ask you that, what do you prefer doing? Do you prefer doing a video essay or do you prefer writing an article? There's no difference. It, it's funny. I think from the outside, people see them as very different. But you know, before you came on, I was writing, um, uh, you know, a piece on BJ Watling, which probably by the time you put this up, will be up, hopefully. Um, and it's the same. The, the only thing that uh, the, the, if I if I was in a perfect world, I would probably always want to do the video only because it allows you to do things that writing an article doesn't. So, for instance, when you have the ability to show a graph, right, you 
if you're writing it and you need to show it, people need to flip their eyes between the two. And I think what video allows you to do is the ability for them to be seeing it while you explain it to them, uh, which uh, I think is, is very, very important. But also think, you know, coming from, you know, the screenwriting background, you know, I, my writing is very visual already. So being able to take that very visual writing and sort of actually bring out some visual elements. Uh, you know, I remember years ago, uh, one of my friends saying that he thought that I would eventually end up writing, uh, uh, that I would end up writing with like an illustrator full time. So a bit like what um, Shea Serrano has done um, in, in American sports writing. And I suppose that I just sort of switched that and made it video. So it was always on the cards. I, I wouldn't say that I, the one thing I've noticed is that there is a particular kind of person who likes long form writing and the videos have the ability to cut through groups of people. So the amount of cricketers who have followed me and sent me messages since the YouTube page went up has gone up tenfold <laughs> because cricketers aren't going to sit there and read a 7,000 word piece. They're just not, they're not, you know, there's a few of them that will, but they're not big readers. I mean, I always make the joke that most cricketers, when you are, they tell you that they read books and what they mean is that they read Tony Robbins, the self-help guru. Do you know what I mean? They don't read, you know, most cricketers haven't read Moneyball. They've watched the Brad Pitt movie, right? Um, and so you have the ability with a video, I think, again, to sort of cut through a little bit of, of that sort of thing. Um, I don't see any reason that there's very few features that if we keep moving the YouTube page the way I want it, there's no reason why I can't write 7,000 word features for ESPN, Guardian, whoever wants them, and also make a video out of them, right? There's absolutely no reason I can't do both. And that's kind of maybe the, the best case scenario uh, for me. We are, we're still very early on in making these. Um, there's a couple of really, really big videos that we have and, um, that we haven't got out yet. Um, one of which doesn't really involve um, sport at all. And uh, we, there's, a, there's a real excitement about writing them at the moment. I'd be very shocked. I mean, if you came to me tomorrow and said for the next 20 years, you have to write long form um, features on something and here's a, a bucket load of money. And then you came to me and said the exact same thing about videos. I'd be happy either way. I think that just where I am at the moment, I know, I basically know how to write a feature, a long form feature with my eyes shut at this stage. And so the stories have to excite me, which they usually do. I think with the video essays, we're actually learning how to create them from scratch. So the, the, the process of making them is still exciting me. Um, maybe in five years time, I won't feel that way about them. But, uh, but yeah, that's kind of how I look at it. But for me, they're very, very similar. Um, we, the ones, like when you see the Mustafisa one, so I, met, I wrote the piece about Mustafisa and then I made the video about Mustafisa. And because I had to, I basically animated that myself other than the actual proper animation bits in it where that was an animator. Um, because of that, I had to change the piece a little bit and make it fit the video meme, uh, me, oh, not meme, the video medium. Um, I don't think that's particularly always going to be the case though, as our animation gets better. Um, and we have the abilities to be able to tell these stories without that. It's good that you mentioned the Mustafa Zood piece because I was just coming to that because I read the piece as well as the video. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm still in the habit of reading. I, I just, I, I've been reading Crick Info for the last 15 years. In fact, I credit Crick Info for whatever knowledge, you know, little, small, little, big or whatever anyone is going to call it is is purely due to reading Greek info. So when I read that piece and when I saw the video, I could I, I could myself, you know, see that I understood more about his bowling action and the biomechanics that go into with the video more because uh, the risk position and everything will will be always be difficult to explain through the uh, through the writing medium because not everyone's also not able to visualize and I think that's also become the case uh, with with a lot of people over the last five six years because uh, a lot of content has also, you know, turned into uh, audio, visual and video. You see it with almost all publications that they're investing heavily into, into the video medium because people are also, you know, not reading much more. They, 
they have also smaller uh, concentration paths if, if if you might want to call it so you know as far as i'm concerned i i just enjoy both i just wanted to ask you what is it that you enjoy more uh, so you know since we are on the topic of mr fizur and uh, you know uh, i've seen me uh, i saw that video and i also uh, you know i've seen you write an article about left uh, left handed players i i i felt that i felt that you have a particular fascination with with left arm players or left handed uh, players uh, in that video itself you you spoke of how left arm bowling can be categorized into two eras before wasim and after wasim so is is it true that uh, left handers fascinate you a lot more than right handers or it's it's just a perception uh no in fact until you mentioned it i didn't really think of it as a thing um so i think that left hand is naturally in anom- anomalies and so i'm more interested in them as as a general case i think that we because most of us grew up in the wasamacram era we don't understand that there were no left arm seamers before wasamacram like there literally it was like alan davidson and you know bruce reed couple of new zealanders uh garfield sobers um uh you know uh, uh what's his name carson garvery um uh am i missing any others um a couple of a couple of the earlier uh, england players like we're talking so few like comically flu- few left arm seam bowlers ever existed before was a macro and people don't know it people don't don't understand it and they don't understand why there has been such a glut of them of recent times and it's not just with macram it's that what what cricket teams now do is they promote left arm bowlers who aren't as good as right arm bowlers because they're left arm that in itself is fascinating because we always did that with left handed batters that's a common thing with left handed batters um uh, it's there are usually you know you can go back to the 70s and 80s and hear tony greg making fun of the australians for picking rubbish left handed uh where australia was so Australia was so clear that they needed left-handers in the middle order um for variety so you couldn't just pick one kind of spinner against them and those sorts of things uh and that teams needed that flexibility that we always went for left-handed batters but we didn't do it with bowlers as much now you have Pakistan having what three four left-arm seamers in the one team you know ph- phenomenal um you know I mean at one stage there were more left arm mitches in the world than there were you know uh, almost anything else going around and and I think that because I know about the history I want to make it very very clear a p- perfect example of this Alan Davison has the of of bowlers with a with a bowling average over 150 Alan Davison has the second best um bowling average of all time right so sorry with uh, with bowlers who've taken over 150 test wickets he has the second best bowling average of all time and yet no one thought to push a bunch of left hand left arm quicks through after alan davidson you can't tell me they didn't exist because i know they did the other great historical story is that we talk about body line all the time right there are two body line bowlers we always talk about yeah um about um uh, i almost said yardley then larwood right his bowling partner was left arm it wasn't just that one they were bowling bouncers one of them was legitimately bowling left arm bouncers bill vose had a different angle to everyone else and he wasn't as quick as larwood we know this um and so i think that you need to i think that when you talk about me being fascinated with left armers i'm no more fascinated with left armers than i am with benny hal and someone who does something completely different or paul adams or um or mustafiza if mustafiza was oh, i mean i'm i'm as fascinated fascinated with mustafiza as i am with um pat brown the england right arm bowler right and so what i'm looking for is these weird sort of random stories and and different occurrences because we don't highlight them properly in cricket you know i i remember th- this is this is a bit of a tangent but a few years ago when when sri lanka beat um india in the uh, is it 2014 uh, world t20 is that the one the final yeah yeah Great. yeah they beat them in the final and i and i basically put out a tweet going you have to understand what a big deal this is right this is 
the most, the richest, most populous cricket nation that we've ever had with players who are uber professionals being paid staggering amounts of money going up against the cricket board where the government's still okay who is in the team. That there is no money in Sri Lankan cricket outside the top level. There is no proper governance of the game. It's an absolute joke. They don't have a lot of people. They're not good at any other sports. Even India has two, three, four other sports. Sri Lanka basically doesn't have any other sports that they're any good at. They're, and yet they have just beaten one of the world's best teams. And we don't factor in any of that sort of stuff. People just people responding to me just going, oh, it's just Sri Lanka beating India in a cricket game. No, it's not. When Sri Lanka win a final... It's not Sri Lanka just winning another cricket game. When Afghanistan qualify for a tournament, it's not just another team um, qualifying for it. And we have to understand that. And it's exactly the same as Bill Vos's story and Alan Davis's story and Wasim Akram's story are incredible because before them, they, there's no one else. I've literally named three of the best five left arm quick bowlers up until 1990. And I've almost named all the guys who've taken over 80 wickets with left arm seam in that time, right? They, they didn't exist in the game. So when Neil Wagner comes along and he bowls in a completely different way that a right armor could not do, right arm could not replicate what Neil Wagner does. We have a completely unique talent. And Mustafa is exactly the same. His ability to spin the ball away from the right hand batsman at pace makes him a completely different thing. And in cricket, we just go... Oh, do you remember that guy when he bowled good for a year? And we forget about it. No. So a lot of my career is just stopping people and going, no, you need to understand why this guy is a big deal, right? This, this guy fits into the history of cricket. Even Mustafiza, two weeks time, he's at a training camp for Bangladesh and he pops out his shoulder and he can never bowl again. He still has an incredible place within our game. And I think that it doesn't matter to me if he bowls left arm, right arm or with what matters to me, essentially, is that they, these guys are doing things that other people haven't done before, and it needs to be written about and kept. I, I did a I did a joking piece for Crick Info on on slow balls, right? And the reason I did a joking piece on it was halfway through. I, I, I sorry, when I came up with the idea, I just figured Cricket must have written about the birth of slow balls like a hundred times. So what's the point of me doing it? I found like one piece that genuinely went through the <laughs> history of slow balls. I mean, you tell me what is a more important thing in cricket now than slow balls. They're literally everywhere. You see knuckle balls in test matches now, right? Go back. Simon O'Donnell is basically the first international cricketer to pioneer the back of the hand slow ball. Where's the 40 minute interview with him about how this happened? How did he learn this, right? Nothing. If it didn't happen in English cricket, it doesn't even exist. You know, uh, talking of slower balls, what, what reminds me, you know, my earliest memory of uh, watching a slower ball bouncer was in the 2007 uh, T20 World Cup when Sean Pollock bowled it in the opening game versus West Indies. I, and you, you probably right, it must have been done before in some other form of cricket. Even Sean Pollock would have, you know, tried it somewhere else rather before trying it in a World T20 game. So you're probably right that uh, there's a lot of stuff that, that just goes unwritten and isn't, uh, you know, isn't something that we talk about a lot. Uh, I mean, seriously.